pass. If that's you, I want to raise you, have you raise your hand. You feel like you've been stalled. You haven't been able to go forward. We're believing God for breakthrough. Breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. Lord, we pray for supernatural intervention to bring about spiritual change, circumstantial changes. We're prophesying circumstances changing, people breaking through into new dimensions. Lord, we pray that you would lift, let's lift the scales off of the eyes of the people of God. We're lifting the scales off the people of God. We're praying for spiritual eyesight to comprehend what mighty God is speaking. We're praying for transformational moments in the lives of God's people. Can you agree with that? Transformational moments. We're believing for transformation. God, I pray for transformation in this nation. Can you say amen to that? Transformation for this nation. But God, we lean into the promises of God Believing for breakthrough. God, we're believing for the men and women of God in this room to earnestly contend for the promises of God that he wants to deliver. The promises of God are yes and amen. And so, Lord, we lean into these promises. We pray for breakthrough. Let's lean into the promise of God. Lean into that. Holy Ghost, we ask you for breakthrough. Our God is a God of breakthrough. Transformation in the lives of people. Transformation in the lives of circumstances. Breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. God, we're praying for Ireland for breakthrough. Lift this nation higher. Heavenly eyesight. Transformation, transformation. So, Lord, I lean into the promise. The soil of Ireland is rich with the promises of God. And we call those promises to come awake. Awake, awake, awake. Jesus. Lord, I pray from heaven you would dispatch angelic forces that would be commissioned for breakthrough. Father, I pray this evening you would send arrows into the hearts of people to reawaken promises of old. I pray for leadership, the leadership of this nation, to be refreshed and renewed and restored in their vision. Let the breath of God come. Let the breath of God come. Let the breath of God come. Transformation. We lean into that, Lord. We're not going to let, let you go. We're going to hold on to you, Lord. So, Lord, we believe from heaven you're going to release angelic forces to stir the promises, to restore them, restore them, restore them. God, I'm praying for restoration for that which has been stolen illegally. And we're believing for restoration of relationships, restoration of promises, restoration of stolen things, of money, of relationships, of buildings. We believe for all of that. Lord, I reach into heaven for this group of people and I pull those things down in Jesus' name.
We pull them down in Jesus' name. Enlarge the vision of your people tonight. Enlarge the faith of your people. We're standing at a transformational moment in the lives of people and the life of this nation, and we're believing for big things from God. Can you say amen one more time? Amen one more time, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, yeah, name of Jesus, Jesus, power in the name of Jesus, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, every chain, break every chain. Break every chain. Deficient sacrifice. Really given what you right. Yes! Power in the name of Jesus. Yes! Power in the name of Jesus. Yes! Power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Chain falling, hear the chains falling. I 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 hear the chains falling. Oh, break. I hear the chains falling. In Jesus' name. Power in the name of Jesus.
Hallelujah. Oh, ila mara mara. That's right. There is a sound of chains falling to the ground. The chains are off. You are set free. The prison doors have been open. You are able to walk out of that because God has given you the victory. You are no longer victor victims, but he has given you the victory. He has made you overcomers. Listen, the season has changed. The season has changed. It's a new season. And what you have experienced in the past is in the past. But now we're walking into a new season. What God has for Ireland, you've never experienced before. What God has for the church and for his believers, his, his people, you have never experienced before. So I say to you, be of good courage because you're walking into the promised land. You're crossing the Jordan. But I'm telling you, when you cross the Jordan, that is your battleground. You must fight for what is yours. You cannot be held back from the past. You must go forward and you must fight. You must fight for the promises of God. They're not just going to fall into your lap. But they are yours. They are yours because it has already been said. The promises of God are yes and amen. I feel that God wants to touch hearts that have been crushed and broken. That there is a season that you walk through which was a terrible, difficult time. And God is, is wanting to heal broken hearts. Hearts that did not have hope hearts that didn't dare to believe God for good. Who are those people? Raise your hand. I want to say you are not damaged goods. God can make all things new. He's the restorer of all things. He's the redeemer. taking you and he's molding you and he's using all that you have gone through. He's going to use it for good. He's going to make you stronger. He's going to cause you to soar. But he's taking all of those things and he does not want you to be crushed by what you've experienced through life. But he's going to cause you to be able to minister to others who have also experience those kinds of things. He's giving you the victory. He's giving you the victory. He's already given you the victory. He's already caused you to triumph.
So, Father, I ask that you touch those hearts, those broken hearts, that you heal them. Put your hand on your heart, those who raised your hands. And, Father, I ask that in the mighty name of Jesus, you would touch those deep parts of the heart that have been uh, hurt, that have been wounded. And, Lord, pour, pour your balm of Gilead into those crevices. Lord, touch those hearts so that they can receive from you, so that they can uh, believe you again, Lord Jesus. For hope deferred is, makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a wellspring of life. Spring up, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well, all over Ireland. Spring up, O oh well. There are wells here, deep, deep wells. Lord, let the waters flow. Let it flow over Ireland. Let it flow over your people. Bring healing to this land. God's touching you. You're moving into a new season now. Believe God. For he'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. He's a good, good father. So good to me. So, so good. You have been so, so good to me. The overwhelming reckless love of God he gazes me down right still I mm -hmm. I don't deserve it
Oh, climb up, come on after me. No, God, you won't kick down. Mm -hmm. Come on after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Don't shine up. Come on after me. He's coming after you. Kick down. Tear down. Come on after me. Yes. Light up. Come on after me. There's no one you won't kick down. No, you won't tear down. Come on after me. The overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down. Right in. Is the ninety nine? Reckless love of God. Hallelujah. 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 Let's take our seats tonight. Hallelujah. God, uh, is, this meeting is still continuing. And uh, we're going to hand over to uh, Tom and uh, Marianne in a, in a second. Uh, but I want to give opportunity tonight maybe just to sow into their ministry. And so I just might ask the guys just to uh, just pass the basket around and uh, just bless them. Praise God. But I really sense tonight God is wanting to do some business with people. As we've just been in worship there, I just sense that the, the Lord would say that the tug of war is over. Because sometimes it's like, you know, we're trying to, to haul into the promised land, into the place of promise, stuff from the past. And what God is saying is, is leave it, let it go. And the minute you let it go, there's freedom to go into the fullness of all that you've got. Hallelujah. You know, the day of running into walls is over. God has opened doors for us to go through. He's made a way. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I just sense God's going to do some, some fresh work in you tonight. So this thing's going to be let go. And you're going to be released. Amen. There's promises that you're going to take a hold of that God has got for you, for your future. Amen. For your destiny. Praise God. I'm going to invite Tom to come. Let's just open our hearts to him tonight. Praise God. Call my wife up. Got something. Thank you all for ministering to me in the presence of God. The presence of God, it's the anointing that. But Peter, I was watching you kind of just with the mic, and I felt like the Lord said, That's a father. The man with the father's heart, but see the kindness of God. And I see the anointing of God and I don't know anything about it. don't know anything <laughs> oh well I, I I do know you've got children um that's about it but um what I feel like is that you're in a new and that there is a surprise God just wants to surprise you with his goodness and I feel like the, there's something like an expectation that you have from God, but God's going to in, not only increase that expectation, he's going to show up and show off. And so I feel like you're going to have some kind of an encounter. Uh, that's just my interpretation. Um, and again, that's all subject. You know, 
Um, but I, I feel like God wants to just bless you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your love of the people. You've just, you're like the Energizer ben Bunny. Do you know that commercial, the Energizer Bunny? You just keep on keeping on. And that um, regardless of the adversity or regardless of what has come in your life, you trusted God with all your heart. And I, I just see the pleasure of God on you. And uh, it's, it's really, <laughs> I'm blessed by it. I'm blessed by it. But I see that the blessings of God go down to me. And I see that happening. It's, uh, who knows, back in your line that may have prayed for you today. But it's not stopping, it's going down a thousand generations. And so I just see the blessing of God on you and your family. And uh, expect more. Uh, I feel like God's saying, um, don't ask for little, ask for big. This is a season of big. This is a season where we can go after God and ask him for the world because he's given us the nations as our inheritance, right? So ask big, ask for the nations. He wants to bring in the nations, but I feel like that's on your heart as well, the nations. And God's saying, um, he's, he's really pleased, but I just see the pleasure of God on you. Amen. Amen. I also saw you with a drum in your hands, and the cadence that you were drumming out was setting the tone for a lot of people that had eyes on you. I believe other leaders have eyes on you. And um, you're not a stranger to you. have, over the years, um, gained trust, uh, a lot of in And there's something about, um, I saw you tapping your foot and playing the drums. And, and I, I, I feel like all of that has to do with the progression of the way God wants to unfold things in this nation. And uh, you have a real sensitivity to that. Um, it's as if reverberations were being sent through uh, the soil, and you were, pick, you were picking up on that. And these reverberations are coming from heaven. I believe that the pace is going to pick up. And uh, for you, the, uh, the scripture about running and not becoming weary, and while young men may grow weary and faint, it's not your portion. God's going to renew your strength like that of an eagle. And I, I do believe that you're going to have um, a reformation of your youth. Um, you probably have studied or heard about um, the molting of an eagle. Uh, when they go through a phase of their life, about midway through life, they uh, lose their feathers. Sometimes they scratch their talents down to nothing. Some lose their beaks. And in that season, other eagles that have been through that process bring them their food. But if they get through that process, their life expectancy doubles. And so, God, that's the portion of Scripture where he says, I'm going to renew your strength like that of an eagle. And I believe that you're about ready to finish that process. And so there's going to be a renewing of your strength and energy. Um, I believe that there's going to be the ability that you have to impart that to others. Words of life that will encourage other people to stay steady on the course and reinvigorate vision that has been lost. I see you dusting off leaders' visions and um, extracting from, I see you in an operating room extracting things from leaders where um, they've been damaged and you're doing repair work. And um, there's not a whole lot of people that uh, God would trust in the operating room, but I believe he's going to trust you with leaders. And this is going to be some delicate surgery. It's going to be some 
some people um, that are going to be very vulnerable, you're going to know how to repair them. Um, you're going to be like the medical professional that's called in, and, and sometimes in a moment's notice, and the, 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 um, the case will be rendered impossible. God's going to give you the wisdom to restore and repair. I, I do believe it's going to flow out of this place. In a, in a larger sense, out of your ministry, um, you need to begin to look at yourself as experts of doing repair work. Because God's going to send into this place, he probably have, already has sent into this place people that need repairs. Am I making sense? It's like they, they have been hurt, wounded, and they've lost, um, some of them have lost their sight for life. And for those of you that have already been repaired, you know the desperate time that you faced and the word that somebody else needs. And so that which you have been given, you're going to be able to give away. This is going to be a house of restoration. And um, I, I believe that uh, the same spirit that helped Nehemiah rebuild what he rebuilt is going to visit this place. That same spirit. And you're going to know what to put your hands to do. Um, there, was a, there was a message that Nehemiah had uh, for the nation when he, when he was permitted by the king to return. And um, he looked at the people and he said this, you see the condition that we're in. Our walls are broken down, our gates are burned with fire. And then he waited for the response of the people. And I believe that this would be a statement that you put over your front door. Let us rise up and build. So you're going to rebuild people. This is not just, people aren't going to come in here just for a good service. They're going to, they're going to come in here to be remodeled and rebuilt. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I have one other thing, and the offering's already been taken, so uh, I, I want to say this, so you know that uh, I'm doing this out of a pure heart, the offering's been taken, okay? I do believe that God wants to release a new perspective and a new release of finances to your house. I believe that God wants to make transformational experience in your own financial bank accounts. I believe he wants to do it all over Ireland. I, I believe that God has spoken to me that he wants finance to rise up in Ireland enough to finance the vision that he has for Ireland. Does that make sense to anyone? And so I'm going to pray for transformation financially. Um, if I could just give this testimony. Um, it was somewhere in the year of 1998 or right around that time where I went to a conference. My wife and I went to a conference and um, they were taking an offering. And I, um, I had, we had a regular practice of giving what I thought was substantial in the offerings. And the Lord told me, I want you to double what you normally give. And uh, I knew how tight things were in our own personal finance. And I knew that if I gave this particular amount, that by the time we got home, I was hoping that we would have enough money to meet our expense. Okay? And so... Um, there were six different offerings that were taken throughout the time of that conference. And every time that the offering was taken, I felt the Lord was telling me to repeat the amount that I just had doubled. And so um, things were so tight in our life financially at that time, I figured, what the heck? You know, what the heck, you can't lose anything. You don't have anything anyhow. And I wanted to try and, I felt like the Lord was stretching us. 
Now, here's what happened. When we got home, um, I, I didn't realize this. When we got home to our back, we were 600 miles from, the conference was 600 miles from us. We got home, and I noticed that the new roof that was just put on our house, that the, the shingles, um, the color did not match other shingles on the roof. And so um, I thought that was kind of odd. So I went to the place where I purchased the shingles, and I said, you know, um, I don't know if the shingles that you gave me were from the same uh, dye lot. And so they sent a representative out there to my house. And again, this is just after we had stretched ourselves as much as we could financially. And so sure enough, the man brought a ladder with him. He climbed up on our roof, and he looked at me and he said, you know, Mr. Hardiman, you are right. These shingles don't match in color. And would you accept $5,000 from our company as a gesture to make up for the things that we've done incorrectly? I said, let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> and then, um, somehow, either Marianne and I were looking in the newspaper, and there was this list of people that had money that was not claimed by them that an insurance company uh, should have refunded their money. And sure enough, we were on the list. It was almost $1,000. And so this was like brand new money that we never expected. And we had like 10 times more the amount than we ever thought to sow in the offering. And I will tell you this, is that I do believe that God is looking for places that he can store money in your account to finance things that he wants to do in the days to come. And so I hope that you're hearing what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not going to benefit by this personally, but I want to encourage you that one of the vehicles through which God enlarges your storehouse is by giving extravagantly. And so I want to encourage you because I do believe that God is looking for people in nations to finance what he wants to do in the time to come. Okay? So Lord, I do pray for a release. Can I pray for finances to be released? Father, I do pray for finances to be released all over Ireland. Lord, I do believe you have big plans for this nation. And God, I, I, I believe that the resource that you had, the place of supply that you had to build the house of God, it came from the people of God. And so Lord, I pray that you would release super, can you hear this, supernatural financial release into the homes of individuals all over Ireland. Supernatural financial release into homes all over Ireland. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do that way in Jesus' name. Okay. Um, I, I need to tell you this about this message. And I'm just telling you this, so if something, if I choose to sit down during the message, it's because I've been having back problems this week. Now, as far as I could tell, I'm going to be able to stand through this whole thing, but I don't want the fact that I might have to sit down uh, dis distract you from some of the things that I want to say, okay? So, Lord, I I'm praying that you would give us... Um, ears to hear what you're speaking to the church. I do believe that we're in a moment in time, oh wow, in a moment in time where there is great sh shift going on in the church of the living God. And so Lord, we want to be so sensitive to hear and see and understand what you're doing that we don't miss one thing 
that you're ready to do on the earth. And Lord, I pray for Ireland. I love Ireland, and I pray that you would give ears to hear to influential people that are going to set the pace for what you want to do in the name of Jesus. Okay, here's where we're going to begin this message. Um, I want to talk about a series, uh, a sequence of time in the Bible that I suspect if you have read the Bible, you're familiar with. Um, some of this is not mainline reading of everyone. And if you haven't read it recently, I believe it will be helpful for me to remind you of this time. And this, this is after the nation of Israel has won the promised land and Joshua and his period of leadership is over. And the, the nation itself has now transitioned into the time of the judges. And in the time of the Judges, of course, there's a book. It's the book of Judges that is written about that time. But the book of Ruth is also written during the time of the Judges. What characterized that time, I want to draw on because I do believe some of the characterizations of that time are some of the things that can characterize our time right now. Three times in the book of Judges, it says this. And there was no king in Israel at that time. And everyone seemed to do what was right in their own eyes. And so there was no real strength of leadership. Now, take this for what it's worth. But in many nations of the earth today, there is not strong, decisive leadership and it seems like in the political environment of those times, everybody is demanding that what happens through our governments happens so it benefits me and it seems right in my own eyes. Unfortunately, some of these characteristics have somewhat seeped into the church. And at times, this is, I, I don't know if this is the case in Ireland, but in the U.S., what, what can characterize some of the atmosphere or the condition of the church is that our church in general in the U.S. has begun to preach in the last 10 or 15 years a gospel of accommodation so that I am preaching or what is being preached in the U.S., is largely messages that can be approved of by the people that attend our church and there seems to be a lack of challenge or a lack of encouragement for people to obey some of the more difficult uh, words that Jesus spoke. I want to say this, and all of us love Jesus. But Jesus, at times, would say things to the masses of people that would thin out the crowd. And so there were several different times that, that you don't have to read too far into the Gospels where Jesus would have a multitude following him and he would say to them, well, now wait a minute guys, if you want to follow me and fit into this group called my disciples, these are some of the qualifications that you need to think about because there's a counting of the cost to that. And you need to be willing to lay down your own life if you want to follow me. And there were other times like in John chapter 6 where Jesus is saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the individuals that were surrounding Jesus, many of whom were his disciples, it said many left at that point and they weren't going to follow him because it was such a hard saying. Now, I, I am not in the practice, nor do I recommend it to preachers, that we say things that are intentionally offensive to people, but there is this part of the gospel where Jesus says, you need to be willing to pick up your cross and follow me. You need to be willing to lose your life 
to follow me, but too often in our nation, in my nation, we are preaching in a large part the simple benefits of Christianity without some of the qualifications to a deeper realm of commitment in the things of God. Does that make sense? And so we have somewhat created an atmosphere where individuals are not challenged and their Christianity is shaped by just doing what's right in their own lives to benefit their own life. And so in, in some respects, that's where we are at back in my nation. And I suspect that it is in, in, some, in some regard in many different nations of the earth. And so if we could characterize that time, it's like the time of Eli, where Eli knew what should be done in the house of God, but he was not confrontive of his people or of his family and his sons, so that the very thing that God wanted to have happen in his house was not being done. Now here's another part to this that I do believe you, I would like to point out. In this season of time, something was happening in an individual, and her name was Hannah. Now, we know Hannah, and we know her life. And Hannah's life had a lot of heartache with it. I mean, we know Hannah, and we know the other wife of Elkanah, and it, it was um, Peninnah. And so Peninnah is taunting Hannah because she does not have children. I suspect that there have been people that have been petitioning God for great things to unfold in their life, and the promises are delayed, such like we see in the life of Hannah. Year after year, she went up, and year after year, her prayer did not seem to be answered. And so here we go. I do believe that individuals have gone through seasons of time where they have deeply petitioned God for something and it just seems to be at an arm's distance. But, get this part. This woman is going to give birth to a whole new thing prophetically that had not existed on the earth. I believe that we're, we're, we're walking in, we're getting... Get this, we're stepping in to a season of time where there's going to be a release of a new breed of leaders. And it's going to be born out of deep heartache. Some individuals, and it may be you, that would be candidates to birth this thing are individuals who have had things delayed and it seems like some of the promises that you have hoped for, it seems like they're never going to come. But I do believe that that condition of desperation can give breed or can give birth to a new thing that God wants to do on the earth. That's some of the conditions that I believe that we're witnessing happen at the church and in the church at large where there's going to be a transformation of the way things are done in the house of God. I, I, I'll tell you this, I get really excited about this sort of stuff. A transformational time in the house of God because there's going to be a new style of prophetic leadership. This new style of prophetic leadership, one of the simple characterizations of Samuel's ministry is that before him, it's, it says this of the time of Eli, there was no vision or was, there was no open vision in that time. And so, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And now we're, we're seeing something being birthed by a woman that seemed to be barren for a long period of time. And the characterization of what God's word would be is that Samuel would not let one word that God spoke fall, to fall to the ground. Wouldn't that be a fabulous church to be a part of? Where God would speak something and the prophetic community would consider it so precious 
that they would review what God had been saying so that nothing that God had been saying would be absent in their life. I, I, I will tell you what an exciting church to be a part of. What did God speak? How's he speaking it? And then how can it be applied to, the, to my very life to see what heaven has authored so that it begins to unfold on the earth? That's transformation to me. And that's, that's in the life of Samuel. But I do believe that we're, we're going to see a different, different type of thing that's characterized in this church or in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that is going to be profoundly different than what we have witnessed on the earth. And I'm not speaking disparagingly of anyone. And I also believe this. Um, I'm getting older. Is, is, is that happened to anybody else? I, I, this October will be 40 years that I've been in ministry. I, I'm married to my wife 39 years. Thank you, Jesus. Like I said today at these meetings we were at together, we've been married 39 years and 37 of them have been good. There were a couple of rough years in there. Not with us, our relationship has always been solid, but oh my word. There were some things that happened. Oh, well, anyhow, we won't talk about those things. So, um, <clears throat> transformational leadership, what's it look like? Um, Samuel gave birth, and, ha and God had him identify the next true leader of Israel, which was David. Now, I, I, I just envision in Ireland where the Samuels of the day have, there's been a transformation of somewhat insipid prophetic grace into a powerful demonstration of what God wants on the face of the earth, and it's able to identify this new breed of emerging leaders. Now, one of the reasons I said that I'm getting older is I still believe that regardless of your age, you can still be part of this emerging company of new leaders. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I just turned 70. And I'm, I'm still believing that God's got a good 20 years for me, if not longer. And I want in on this group of new powerful prophetic unfolding of what God wants to do on the, on the face of the earth. So Samuel identifies David as this man that is going to be transformational. And I want to talk about transformational leadership because David is going to be different in his style of leadership than anyone that has existed up to that period of time, probably on the face of the earth. You know, um, a common practice of the kings of that day was when you were set into a position of authority or power, all of your rival, rivals were to be executed. I mean, what, what, Sam, what Saul was doing was not uncommon. If you felt you had a rival, it was not uncommon to execute your rival. And so at a certain point in time, um, Saul actually commissions 3,000 assassins to go find and kill David. I, 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 that had to be a dangerous time for David. But David here, it, he is not going to react in a vengeful way towards Saul. As a matter of fact, David has men around him, and these, these are the mighty men of valor that are around David, and these guys that are around David at certain points, when Saul is vulnerable, there's a guy named Abishai that goes into the camp uh, where Saul and his company are sleeping. And I love this term, but it's probably not a good thing to admire. Abishai says to David, um, he's asleep, and I have this spear here, and I'll run him through, and I won't have to do it twice. He wants to do away with his enemy. But David is seeing 
the anointing on a man of God, and he's not going to prematurely step into that position on his own. And David exhibits this kinds of characteristics many different times in his leadership style, and his leadership style is transformational in the way it is being done, and he introduces something, and by what he did, he gains the respect of the men that surround him. I mean, this is one of the reasons I do believe that David had such a distinguished group of men around him is because he modeled things that were not merely on the earth. He modeled things that were out of heaven. And so David has this powerful um, time in which he is seeing things that are even New Testament in their styles of worship, like we, we know about, of, about the tabernacle of David, and how there was a certain authentication of the way worship should be done, but David was opening it up in a different fashion that was not necessarily authorized from something out of that time, but I believe prophetically David was seeing into something that was in the future, and he was bringing it into his present. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if the new style of leadership would see something that is in heaven in the future that all of us could enjoy and bringing that into the time of the present and helping the people of God access the will of God which is done in heaven actually being authenticated and walked out on the earth. And so this, this new company of people is going to be a powerful group of people. And I do believe that there are invitations right now that are going out to the people of God, inviting us to be part of this company. This will be an elite group of people, not that we're special or above anybody else, but it's going to be walking in a style and uh, a fashion of leadership that has not been modeled on the earth thus far. Let me, let me kind of fast forward into another individual that's part of this, what I would call the new style of leadership. And we, we talked about him, and there was reference to this this morning in one of our meetings when somebody was prophesying, I believe it was to John, about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, to me, is an amazing individual. Now, John the Baptist was, um, now we, we know how he, was, he came about. Um, his mom was barren, his dad, and both, both of them apparently had given up hope for the promise that they felt they had of having a son. And so we know that in the dialogue that Zechariah, his dad, is ministering in the house of God. And while he's on his regular shift, Gabriel appears to him and tells him what's going to happen. And as a result of Zachariah's unbelief, he's struck dumb until John is going to be christened or, I mean, circumcised. Now, here's the interesting part about this to me, because I do believe that John's part of this new style of leadership. And for leaders in the room, um, there's a delicate line to walk. Because, get this, John's birthed into the system. I mean, he's probably heard or watched or seen a lot of the routines that were very much practiced and the traditions of his time, he's probably very familiar with all of that. But there's something at some point in the life of John where he somewhat sees some of the, the necessary adjustments that God wants to make within the system that need to be made in order to it more adequately represent what God originally intended. And so I do believe that what... what is going to be part and parcel of this new breed of leadership is that they see what's going on in the system. Some of the practices, 
some of the traditions of the systems that we're very familiar with are the very thing that God wants us to bring adjustments and correction to. And I will tell you this, that type of ministry needs a whole lot of courage because you're, a, you're swimming upstream and the traditional ways that things were being done by the scribes and Pharisees of that time, they weren't inviting a voice like John. At a certain point, there are things that God has designed for the church, and there are certain things that God wants implemented in the church, and the prophetic voice of John was calling the church and the leadership of that style of that, of that period of time to make those sort of adjustments. Now, let me just say this. Um, I do believe in a, the overall evaluation of what's going on in the church. Um, I do believe that what's going on in the church is that um, sometimes the church in different cultures has been more defined by the culture itself than what God wants in the church? Um, it, it, I, I, thank you very much. There's great pressure in the U.S. right now. And uh, in two of our states, we have 50 states. And in two of our states, there have been legislation that has been submitted in two states to make it illegal for pastors in the state of Washington and the state of, Missis in the state of Massachusetts. It would make it illegal for them to read out of Romans chapter 1 and Leviticus chapter 25 because it has adverse language to same-sex marriage and same-sex and homosexuality. It would make it illegal. It would be considered hate speech to read out of those portions of Scripture. And so um, I do believe that there's pressure in our societies today for us to preach a gospel of accommodation rather than stand up and take a stand for the Word of God, that the Word of God is true. Now, I know that in several nations that we have been in, that the whole LGBT um, movement is putting great pressure in the society to accommodate and accept that style of life as normal. Now, I, I want to tell you this, is that I don't have an ax to grind but I, uh, against that style of life. I, don't, I believe it's sinful, but I'm not particularly always speaking against it. But I will tell you this, I don't believe it's about that. I believe it's about taking a stand for the Word of God. And here's... This is the, I supervise a lot of the pastors in the Morning Star Network. And one of them um, it was in the state of Washington. And he called me and told me what was this legislation was that was being proposed. Now you want to hear what was really disturbing? The, he said, I was not so disturbed about the proposed legislation. I was more disturbed by the reaction of the pastors in the room with regard to what was being presented to them. And here's what he said the reaction of the pastors were in the room. And he said there were about 25 or 30 pastors in the room at the time. And he said the reaction of the pastors was not, we need to stand up and fight because we need to take a stand for God. He said many of the pastors said this, I don't need to read out of that portion of the Bible. There's a, there's a big Bible out there, and I could read many other things. You know, in, in the city of Houston, Texas, now this, is, this to me is disturbing because there is pressure 
to infiltrate the church and somewhat have the church tailored to the, to the belief systems of, of today. And in this city, a, the, the woman that was the, the mayor of the city at this time was a homosexual woman. She was a lesbian. And she proposed to her city council that all pastor's messages would be submitted to her to be read before the Sunday service, and if she did not approve them, they could not use those messages. Well, that didn't go very far with the pastors. Thank the Lord. But um, the point that I'm saying about this new breed is that there is going to be pressure in all of our societies that we have that we not be conforming to the system or the style that religious organizations should take. We need to stand up and have a backbone and lift our voices with great courage against that kind of infiltration and that force of darkness that is endeavoring to penetrate its way and define Christianity in a way that Jesus would never have permitted it. Are you hearing me? And see, to me, one of the chief characteristics of this new breed of leaders is that they need to be men and women of God of courage. We can't be counting... You know, I, 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 there's a movie, and you, it's probably here now, but it's a movie about Paul the Apostle. And to be honest with you, when I saw this movie with my wife, I was a little bit taken aback by it. Because of all that Paul and Timothy were sacrificing at that time, and it seems like the, the atmosphere in which I minister in, in different places in the world, it's not nearly as challenging or as demanding as what it was for Paul at that time. And so I, I do believe that there's going to be a supernatural experience that is going to release courage to the men and women of God that's going to characterize this new breed. Um, and I, I, when, I, when I talk about this, I, I do believe there's going to be transformation that's happened. When I talk about this, I, I refer back to the first time. Now, um, I, I want to tell you this. It's not that my life never had challenging moments uh, up until, uh, you know, my, in my mid-30s. I was, I was an Olympic athlete. I played in the 72 Olympic Games. I played handball. And so I had fierce competition that I was against almost my entire uh, adult athletic career. And I knew what it was like to go out and face some really very challenging athletic opponents. And so I drew upon that experience when I started ministering. But I want to tell you this. Um, there's a difference between having fortitude for the hour in an athletic competition and having courage when God is asking it of you. I can remember the first time that I was really in a very vulnerable moment in uh, my ministry. And I was being called to answer for some of the conduct that I had as a minister. And some of it was uh, pretty intimidating because the head of our movement was asking me to give account to him. And I thought of him as a spiritual giant. And indeed, at that time, he was, he was quite a man of God. But I can remember the experience of walking up the steps to his office and wondering how this meeting was going to happen and what was going to happen in this meeting. And believe me, uh, this was not any moral question or anything like that. It was based upon a judgment that I had made that involved his son-in-law. And so it w was not a moral thing or... It, 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 yeah, and it wasn't Rick Joyner. It was another movement that I was in. And so um, 
as I'm getting ready, I'm about from here to the back of the back of this room, away from the door. And I'm, I'm going to have to knock on this door and go answer these questions. And all of a sudden, I felt something settle on me like a mantle. And as I was moving closer to the door, I felt like, I can answer this man. And here's, here's what I came to find out after um, this experience was the, the word courage in the, New, in the Old Testament, it's, it can be defined as the breath of God. And something got breathed into me that I didn't have, that I didn't have on me when I was walking up the steps. And something changed in me. It was like, I can do this. And I went into this meeting, and what occurred to me while I was in this meeting, there's a portion of Scripture that says when you're called before the governors or whatever, don't even give a thought to what you're going to answer. The words are going to be given to you at the time. And I was listening to myself in this meeting, and I was like, outside of myself, List, watching me answer these questions and going, man, that was a good answer. You, you sounded pretty good in that. And I walked out of that meeting. I, I, I want to tell you this. This new breed of leaders is going to be very familiar with courage. They're going to be very familiar with the breath of God. It's going to be needed in the things that we're facing. But I, I, I feel like what God, how does this apply to all of us in this room? I feel that God wants to enlarge our thinking, to embrace what he wants to do in our hour, because he wants a transformative, um, a transformative group of people that he can entrust with great responsibilities, embracing the new things that he's doing, and the changes that he wants to bring about in the church to release something that has never, ever existed on the face of the earth. I'm wanting to be part of that company. And I, I do believe that God's inviting us to be part of this transformational army. There's another part to this, which I'm not going to get to tonight, but... If you'd like to dig into this further, there's another style of leadership that's even greater than what I'm talking about. And it's not transformational leadership. It's what Jesus brought in, and it's called transcendent leadership. It's taking the principles that are embodied in the heart of God in heaven and having them walked out by the leaders of the earth. One of the chief and primary characteristics, thank you for this, I'm sorry that I'm dripping here, but it happens. The biggest problem is I can't pick that up right now. Thank you. This trans transcendent leadership, one of the primary characteristics of it, and I, I must say that I was in a meeting today with a lot of leaders in Ireland. Um, it's servant leadership, and I, I felt that in that room today. That there have been, over long seasons of time, imperfections in all of us as leaders, and God has been working on all of us to position us and to have our character fashioned in such a style that we're really endeavoring to be the servant leaders that really will define greatness in the kingdom of God. I want to say this in closing. Um, Jesus never, ever discouraged greatness in the kingdom. He never discouraged it. As a matter of fact, there are three times in the scriptures where Jesus said, if you want to be great, or here's how to be great, you become a servant. And, I, 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 you know, there's, there's one more I'll refer to is if anybody's ever speaking ill or bad about you, 
rejoice in that day. For great will be your reward in heaven. And I know in that meeting today that we were in, there were a lot of people that had been spoken of in a fashion that was not complimentary. And I do believe that the imprint of greatness is upon individuals who really characterize this servant style of leadership that Jesus really wants to see modeled in the time to come. I want to see great things happen with all of you. I know this is prophetic meeting, but you, I believe God wants to expand our thinking to have us embrace a time and hour that we live in where God's going to do things on the earth that have never been done before. He indeed is saving the best wine for last, and he's inviting us to be part of that company. So Lord, we pray tonight that you would expand our thinking. You would help us think bigger. Lord, I do believe that many people are at a very pivotal moment where the bush that Moses had is burning brightly in their life, and there's a lot at stake. And so I, I pray, Lord, that in this transformational time, everyone would give you the right answer. Yes, Lord, send me. I'm going to do it. I'm willing. And tra great transformation can happen not only in Ireland, but all the nations of Europe. Thank you for your attention. God bless you. Love Peter and just so admire him, although we haven't known him that long. This is a man of great integrity and great, great leadership. In Jesus' name, bless you, Peter. Praise God. I believe that the word tonight has been very timely. And the one thing that you must understand is, is that Every one of you are leaders. Every one of you are leaders. If you're born again, if you breathe, someone is following you. You are going to impact somebody in some capacity. So don't take this message as being something simply for, you know, pastors or leaders. No, this message is for you. And the Ireland of the 21st century of... 2018, I believe one of the th key things that God is calling his people to be are leaders. And we're, he's calling us at this moment in time to accept the responsibility, the ownership of that. Amen? This is not a time to back off. This is a time to step up to the plate. And that's a, a sense that I've had since the beginning of the year. There's too much at stake. And it's not going to be a one-man band. It's a body. It's a body of believers who understand that each one of them are leaders. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for tonight. Let's just stand to our feet. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me just ask you, just to, if you could just I'd invite you just to lift your hands. As we lift our hands, we're just surrendering to God. Hallelujah. So, Father, I thank you that you've been with us tonight. I thank you your word has been spoken tonight. You've been sharing and you've been speaking to us tonight. And so, Father, I pray for a, a shift in our perspective that we would take this word that has been shared tonight. And we would allow it, Lord my God, to go deep into our core of our being, that it might become part of us, that it would transform us from seeing ourselves, Lord, as spectators and uh, members, oh God, seated in pews, to rather than members of an army, whom you've called, Lord, for such a time as this. So, Father, I pray tonight, Lord my God, for an anointing of leadership, Lord, to come upon your people. We're called, Lord, to be kings and priests and prophets. So, Lord, let that anointing, Lord, be released, Lord, in lives tonight. And, Lord, I pray, Jesus, that, Lord, we will no longer, Lord, Walk in intimidation. We'll walk, Lord, in that courage as sons and daughters 
of a king who rules and reigns. So we pray, Lord, bless, Lord, your people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.